This week's episode is sponsored by Easy Roller Dice. RPG players can never have enough dice, and these affordable and high-quality dice are perfect for building a personalized collection on a lightweight budget. Their dice come in a huge range of colors, materials, and fonts, so you can have the perfect set to match your characters, spells, and monsters. We've been using their awesome dice trays at our own game table to keep all of our dice in one place for years now. Visit EasyRollerDice.com or follow the links in the description below to visit their online store. You'll also find below our discount code, which you can use to save on select purchases. And now, on to this week's episode. Greetings, my name is Monty Martin. And I'm Kelly McLaughlin. And And we we are are the Dungeon Dungeon Dudes. Dudes. Welcome to our channel, where we cover everything Dungeons & Dragons, including advice for players and guides for dungeon masters. We upload new videos on Tuesdays and Thursdays, so please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Today, we are talking about how to build a Divine Soul Sorcerer in Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. This is one of the coolest subclasses available to sorcerers in D&D 5e, adding a touch of divine power and access to the cleric spell list to one of the most flexible but incredibly focused classes in the game. One of the limitations of the sorcerer is the limited spells known that you get, and this problem persists even more with the divine soul, because with access to two amazing spell lists, it can be really hard to decide which ones you're going to take. And one of the keys is which metamagics you have and how your spells integrate with that. But by blending the arcane and divine, the results can be quite potent indeed. There's a lot to discuss, so let's get rolling. So let's kick things off with a quick review of what you get as a Divine Soul Sorcerer. First and foremost, you get the entire Cleric spell list as an option for you to take spells from as well. Divine Soul Sorcerers get their magic from some sort of connection to a Divine Entity. Perhaps you might even be descended from one of the gods themselves. So you'll be able to choose any spell from the cleric spell list whenever you gain a level or retrain. In addition, depending on the exact source of your divine power, whether it's good, evil, chaotic, or lawful, or neutral, you get one additional spell, which can either be cure wounds or inflict wounds for good or evil, bane or bless for chaos versus law, and if you're neutral, it's protection from evil or good. You can actually retrain this spell out for another spell on the cleric spell list in the same manner that that all sorcerers can retrain their spells whenever they gain a level. You also gain Favor of the Gods, which allows you to add 2d4 to an attack roll or saving throw once per short rest. At level 6, you gain the Empowered Healing ability, which allows you to spend sorcery points to re-roll the healing dice used to determine how much a creature within 5 feet of you gets from healing. What's interesting about this ability is that you can use this to empower both your own healing spells and the healing spells of your other party members, which creates an interesting situation because with your such limited spells known, you might not want to load up on a lot of healing spells with your Divine Soul, so making sure you get the most out of them is really important. At 14th level, you gain otherworldly wings. You now have wings and a flying speed and can fly around the battlefield. Finally, at 18th level, you gain the Unearthly Recovery Power, which allows you to, as a bonus action once per day, when you are under half hit points or lower, regain all your hit points. The most exciting thing for me about the Divine Soul Sorcerer is the cleric spell list is misleading to newcomers, I find. A lot of people think of clerics as just healers, but their spell list is jam-packed with some of the coolest and best blasty spells in the entire game. Not to mention a ton of great utility, healing, it's really an all-encompassing spell list. And I think clerics get kind of the back seat to some of the other options in the game because people see them as the healer, but there's so much more than that. And having access as a sorcerer to this spell list means that there is a world of options in front of you. And you can build your Divine Soul Sorcerer in so many unique and cool ways. If you are the party healer, there are options here that will allow you to be a decent healer. Not the best, but a decent one. But there's also options here that work phenomenally well with meta magic. And that's the other thing. Sorcerers have meta magic. Clerics have a great spell list. You combine these together and you get a really interesting character on the battlefield that no other class or subclass can really perform the same things that this one does. I also think the Divine Soul Sorcerer has a wealth of role-playing opportunities 
for playing one. On paper, the Divine Soul kind of reads like a holy or good aligned character, but there's no reason why it, there, that needs to be the case. The gods of the worlds of Dungeons and Dragons are fantastically diverse. There are gods of trickery, magic, dragons, fire, storms, and the combination of the cleric spell list and the combination of the regular sorcerer spell list allows you to capture the flavor and feeling of all sorts of different divine entities. Your character doesn't need to be a divine soul of a holy rolling deity of good light and happiness. They could be a pretty dark entity that animates the dead, uses psychic and necrotic spells, and really represents those evil or trickery sort of forces that exist in the world. I also really like just conceptually the idea of a divine soul that is empowered by the gods or goddesses of magic themselves in the setting. It's a really, really natural thing. So you can actually blend this arcane divine and divine element in a really cool way as you role play your character and decide how much they embrace their divine origins or ancestries or how much they try to reject that and buck the trend, maybe using this divine gift in a way that runs counter to the deity's purposes. Speaking of ancestries, let's go over some of the options for ancestries and talk about which one fits the divine soul sorcerer the best. Now, of course, if you are using the new rules presented in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, Almost any character ancestry can move its ability score increases around to get that really, really juicy bonus to your charisma score, which I think everyone's going to want. Inherently, there are lots of great player character options that come with that naturally, such as the Azamar or the Tiefling or even the Dragonborn, which would all be great options. I am particularly still partial to the Half-Elf as well. I think that all of these characters as well very much embody the kind of um, mixed ancestry, divine magic, getting in the bloodline sort of flavor. And, and an Azamar or Tiefling divine soul is completely on point to represent this. I think if you want to go with the standard options of either the variant human or the custom ancestry option in Tasha's, uh, these both present great options as well. But while we're discussing using the options in Tasha's, I think we need to make a case for the Mountain Dwarf as well. <laughs> yes. Uh, not only does the Mountain Dwarf, now with being able to mix and match where your, uh, where your ability score improvements go, you're getting a plus two and a plus two. So you can do charisma and constitution to make sure you have those two down. But on top of that, the Mountain Dwarf gains proficiency with medium armor, which on a sorcerer is going to be extremely valuable. Yeah, if you can fill out your medium armor with a plus one or plus two dexterity bonus and slap on some half plate or a breastplate, this is really going to boost the AC of the Divine Soul Sorcerer and allow them to have a little bit more of the resilience that you would associate with a typical cleric because many cleric spells, some of the best ones, are quite short ranged. So you might be getting pretty close up to your enemies to make the most of them and having that big, beefier armor class is really going to help, and it's going to save you having to spend your precious spells known on spells like Mage Armor and Shield, just so you can stand up on the front lines. One reason to look at the Variant Human or the Tasha's Custom Lineage is that they both start with a feat option for you, mm -hmm. and the Sorcerer, Divine Soul Sorcerer, loves having feats. Let's talk about some of our favorite feats and why we would pick them up. I think that Tasha's Cauldron of Everything was very generous to sorcerers, especially Divine Souls, and there are five feats that I would strongly consider that were all introduced in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything that it's really hard to not want them <laughs> for your Divine Soul. Now, some of these choices might be because we just love these feats in general and they go well on almost any character, but I'll start things off with uh, Telekinetic. Yes. Uh, you're kind of not really doing anything that amplifies the sorcerer specifically here, but telekinetic is a nice addition to a spellcaster. It gives them a few extra things to do on their turn, and you can push things around with your mind, which is just so much fun to do and has a lot of mechanical benefits. It, it feels at home on a sorcerer. Also, its cousin, telepathic, both of these feats come with a plus one bonus to intelligence, wisdom, or charisma. So you can use these to pump up your primary casting stat while getting up some really useful abilities. I also want to mention Fey Touched and Shadow Touched. 
Both of these feats also allow you to get a plus one bonus to your Charisma, Intelligence, or Wisdom score, but they also give you additional spells known. You can use these spells once per day without using a spell slot, but then you can use your spell slots to cast them normally. Fate Touched gives you Misty Step, and Shadow Touched gives you Invisibility, and both give you a first level spell of your choice from a limited selection of schools of magic, but this actually is a great way to get a spell like Hex, or Disguise Self, or Cause Fear, or Dissonant Whispers, all of which are great spells for sorcerers. So I think that these are all worth looking at. They're great options for both boosting your charisma and expanding your sorcerer's options. They all help you kind of get around that very limited number of spells known that the sorcerer really buckles under, especially at early levels of play. Another one that is key for sorcerers is going to be Metamagic Adept. This allows you to take extra metamagics. Now, on any other class, it's actually not as useful as it is on the sorcerer. The sorcerer being able to add more metamagics to the roster is just going to open up even more possibilities for your spell casting, which is something that the sorcerer really wants. If you take metamagic adept at level four, you effectively double the number of metamagic abilities your character has and increase your sorcery points by 50%. That is a massive character boost and Flat out, I think Metamagic Adept is an absolute must-have for every single sorcerer. Um, and I, I, it's very hard to not take it because it's so good. Yeah. Some other feats that we think are just great classic picks for the sorcerer are things like War Caster, Inspiring Leader, and Ritual Caster. These three feats are kind of the bread and butter feats of a lot of spellcasting classes and are going to benefit your sorcerer here as well. Me personally, with my sorcerer, I'm almost certainly going to take it either or of Shadow Touched or Fey Touched and either or of Telekinetic or Telepathic and Metamagic Adept. If that hasn't already boosted me up to 20 Charisma, I will probably take the ability score boost from there and then I'll see what else I can pick. It's really, as much as I love Warcaster and Inspiring Leader, I don't ever see myself taking these feats as a sorcerer at lower levels of play, especially with Warcaster because sorcerers innately have proficiency in constitution saving throws, so making their concentration checks is not as big a problem for them as it is for other casters. Let's get into the real meat of why we're all here. Let's talk about the metamagic options and the spell selections. Now, we've talked about the sorcerer in great detail in other videos. We have a video on the metamagic options, which you can check out right up there. And we have also done a video on the spell selections from the sorcerer list as it stands, which you can also check out right up over there. So for today, we are going to focus on what metamagic options pair with the cleric spells presented in meaningful ways. We hope that combining all of these together will give you a really clear picture of how to build not only a sorcerer, but a sorcerer who has access to the divine magic of the cleric. Think of it kind of as like a divine pairing. It's a divine pairing of wine and cheese, but the wine is divine magic and the cheese is sorcerer magic. Of course, with any sorcerer, you're going to be really tempted to take the typical standby spells like Web, Fireball, Counterspell, Haste, Polymorph, Banishment, and Dimension Door. But then balancing those great choices against the Cleric spell list is really hard. <laughs> Chances are with your cantrips, you're going to look at all the standard options presented to the sorcerer, and there's a lot of great options there. But you should also consider looking at Guidance and Toll the Dead from the Cleric list. Both are excellent choices that feel really appropriate for a Divine Soul Sorcerer. Now, I think the biggest candidate to use with the Cleric spell list for the, the Sorcerer Meta Magic is actually Twin Spell. There are a lot of super juicy Cleric spells that are normally single target, and being able to twin them is pure money. So let's talk about what some of those ones are. I want to kick things off by just saying how good Guiding Bolt is as a twin spell. Yeah, Guiding Bolt is already a great spell choice, even if you don't have twin spell. Not only does it do a good amount of damage, but it gives the next person who attacks the target advantage on their attack roll. So by twinning it, you now get to deal out twice the amount of damage and you have two targets that the rest of your party can wail on with advantage, making it way better. So that is our first choice. I also want to bring in here 
healing word. Oh, yeah. Healing word is your wonderful spell that if a character is going down or has gone down, from a distance, you can get them back into play. If you have two characters go down, you're in trouble. But with twin healing word, you're not. I also want to point out the possibility of doing a twin revivify. Yes. <laughs> it, it, it's really bad. If you have a double KO and twinning revivify, that would be an awesome moment in a campaign. But with those spell options and the twinned meta magic, what you're doing is you're turning the Divine Soul Sorcerer into the most life-saving character. Revivify is great and a great lifesaver. So is Healing Word. Twinning them with the Sorcerer is outstanding and will change what seems like a dire situation at the table into a triumphant situation. This also works really, really well with spells like Greater Restoration and Heal, yeah. which can, which are just made so much more efficient by the ability to twin them. It's not often that you're going to need that much healing, but twinning a heal spell is a hefty cost. It's a six level spell slot and it's six sorcery points. But if you need that much healing in the middle of battle, you're going to be glad you brought that along. Yeah, and I think a twin spell in general is a meta magic that actually ranks third or fourth on my list for most sorcerers. But when we look at the Divine Soul, it jumps up to one of the first choices that I would take. Another great meta magic option for the Divine Soul Sorcerer might be the extended spell meta magic, specifically using this with spells like Aid. Clerics have a lot of great buff spells in their roster, and being able to amplify the length that those are going to last can have a really major impact on the adventure. Yeah, one of my favorite uses of the Aid spell with Extended Spell is actually the fact that Aid lasts 8 hours, and Extend Spell takes that to 16 hours. So you can actually cast the spell with the meta magic before you take a long rest, and the spell will stay in effect during the next adventuring day, allow you to roll things over. Similar to how you can roll over a Hero's Feast, because it lasts 24 hours. Um, this is a really great way to buff up your party on a long-term basis and kind of fire and forget with Extended Spell. And because Extended Spell is so cheap as a meta magic, there's a lot of great other buff spells like um, Freedom of Movement and Death Ward that don't require your concentration that last normally just for an hour, but getting twice as much duration out of them can be really good in a long haul adventuring day. We also have to recommend things like Subtle Spell, Empowered Spell, Quicken Spell, and Heighten Spell, which are all really great options, although they're great whether or not you're playing the Divine Soul. But keep in mind some of the spell combinations that you can do using these meta magics and the way that that opens up when you have access to two spell lists. Now, there's actually a handful of cleric spells that you might want to take with your Divine Soul Sorcerer because they are so amazing, but they actually don't play well or interact at all with your meta magic. So this is a tricky choice because you want to make sure that if you take these spells, that you still have taken other spells that match with your meta magic well, but these are strong contenders. My first option is Spiritual Weapon. This is one of my favorite cleric spells, and honestly, anybody can benefit from an extra weapon flying around the battlefield. So with Spiritual Weapon, you cast an attack as a bonus action. So this actually doesn't help the Quicken Spell argument at all. You might still want Quicken Spell later for some other great combos that you can put into play here, but this actually makes less of a case for taking Quicken Spell because you now can weaponize your bonus action with Spiritual Weapon. Yeah, if you were quickening a spell just to toss out a cantrip before, being able to take Spiritual Weapon in this way largely negates the benefit of ever doing that. So I find that with my Divine Soul Sorcerers, I prefer taking Spiritual Weapon and just ignoring Quicken Spell until much higher levels when I can use it with things like Sunbeam or Telekinesis. That's when it becomes really, really good. And just having Spiritual Weapon as a nice standby all through my career. Another spell that I totally love for Divine Soul Sorcerers off the Cleric spell list, though, is Spirit Guardians. This is such a fantastic blast damage dealing and battlefield control spell all in one. It's going to be using up your concentration, and it's going to require you to get quite close to your enemies. But there's a couple cool ways to mitigate that. Now we've mentioned this spell before as a great option for sorcerers to be able to pick up. And we did get a lot of comments saying, why on earth is your sorcerer within 15 feet of enemies? Apparently, 
I play much more deadly games than a lot of people <laughs> out there, and Monty often surrounds my sorcerer with enemies, regardless of anything I try. There are going to be combat encounters where you end up in the thick of it. It's unavoidable. On top of that, Spirit Guardians doesn't affect your allies. So there is a really great way here that you can put your allies around you, cast Spirit Guardians, which also slows the movement of enemies that enter it. So it is actually a shield preventing people from getting to you while your Paladin and Fighter and other sorts are around you fighting the enemies who get into range and you move around with them on the battlefield. It can actually be a really potent option and you're using your allies as the meat shields while you keep everybody safe with Spirit Guardians. I think there are still a million cases to be made on why Spirit Guardians is a great choice for a sorcerer to pick up. And yeah, if you're playing in a campaign where you're at the table with eight other players and you have Spirit Guardians, but you're never getting into combat because everybody else is blocking enemies from getting to you, then maybe it's not the best choice. But if you're playing with a smaller group, chances are you're going to end up surrounded at some point, probably multiple points in the campaign. And this spell could save the day and save the whole party and help out a lot on the battlefield. Honestly, at higher levels of play, that Mountain Dwarf Divine Soul Sorcerer flying around with wings is feeling pretty tough. You're going to have a pretty respectable AC, especially if you take spells like Shield to boost it up when you need it to. And uh, with the flying speed that you get from the Divine Soul, uh, you can hover out of enemy's reach. <laughs> because the radius of Spirit Guardians is 15 feet. So you can just kind of fly over their head, and if they don't have any ranged attacks or any way of reaching you in, in the air, they're just going to be sitting in your Spirit Guardians with nothing they can do about it. So there's lots of great play around this, um, and I just find that ultimately the Divine Soul rolling out there with this, the cl standard cleric package of Spirit Guardians, Spiritual Weapon, tossing down... Um, Toll the Dead or Sacred Flame or Firebolt, you can really rack in the damage there. And it really it's a really great way to get a lot of damage on the board. Another spell that I think needs to be considered here that isn't on the Sorcerer list is Animate Dead. Oh my god. And there's a lot of yeah. animating dead that can happen. This, along with other spells like Create Undead that are available to the Cleric, are really cool ways to bring your sorcerer into a more necromancy sort of build. And the cleric spell list offers that. Why would you need the fighter or the barbarian to protect you when you have a meat shield of undead minions protecting you while you cast spirit guardians? Right? If you cast <laughs> animate dead and you get your little army and you cast spirit guardians and just walk around the battlefield with an undead army inside of spirit guardians... Yeah, you do want to get into yeah. combat there. And if the bad guys are like, oh, I'm just going to fireball you, well, you're a sorcerer with counterspell. When we were looking at our high-level sorcerer spells, both Kelly and I observed that the 7th and 8th level spell selections for sorcerers are kind of middling. And so Divine Word and Holy Aura are two great contenders that when you put them up against the other spells available to high-level sorcerers are really good options to consider. I might even consider taking other spells like Word of Recall or Hero's Feast with my Divine Soul Sorcerer as well. I'm still going to take Wish with my ninth level spell slot, though. <laughs> That's fair. The ninth level spell slot, it's hard to beat Wish, but there are some more options presented from the Cleric spell list if you get up that high. I also think there is a case to be made that if you are one of the only spellcasters at the table, this opens up an avenue that is usually only suggested for the Wizards, but it's actually on the Cleric spell list as well, and that is a lot of the divination magic. If you want to play into that and build a character who is a great diviner, uh, you get access to things like scrying that are not normally available to sorcerers. And so you can build a really cool divine sorcerer. The blend of the sorcerer and cleric spell list opens up some really potent combinations and some really interesting strategies. I think the biggest downside to all of this is that while you still have a lot of flexibility in your choices, I always feel that my Divine Soul Sorcerers have been quite narrowly focused. So you really have to focus around a couple core strengths because in the marriage of those two combinations, you're going to be able to do a handful of things 
really, really, really well that are going to be adaptable to many situations, but you might not have the smorgasbord of options, especially compared to many of the newer sorcerer subclasses like the Aberrant Mind and the Clockwork Soul. Uh, for me, while the Divine Soul absolutely remains one of the strongest sorcerer subclasses, it is absolutely still a challenge to build and play one. Hopefully some of this advice helps you out. One of the things that I love about the Divine Soul and the Cleric Spell List is that it actually opens up this world of wizardly type things that we thought were only exclusive in that realm. Things like creating a sorcerer who leans into necromancy or a sorcerer who leads into divination. These are things that have opened up because of the addition of the Cleric Spell List. However, as Monty said, one thing that you always need to consider is that the wizard and the cleric are kind of like Swiss army knives. They always have a million and one solutions to every problem because of the vast options they have within their spells and the large amount of casting that they get to do. Sorcerers are more refined than that, and so choosing your specialty, deciding on how you're going to portray your Divine Soul Sorcerer, what avenue you're going to take, finding the right mix of all of these elements is going to allow you to create a powerful and potent character for your adventures. So this has been a look at the Divine Soul Sorcerer in Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. If you have any experience playing a Divine Soul Sorcerer, tell us about it in the comments below. The videos that we create on our channel are made possible thanks to the incredible generosity of our Patreon supporters. If you enjoy the work that we do here on YouTube, please consider joining our Patreon community and chatting with us in our patron-exclusive Discord server. You can find out how you can join it by following the links in the description below. And also, our live campaign Dungeons of Drakenheim is coming to Kickstarter. We've partnered with Ghostfire Games to bring this campaign to life as a 5th edition module. You can follow the links below to join the mailing list to be up to date on all of the information involving this Kickstarter, which is launching later this year. And don't forget to check out our live play in the Worlds of Drakenheim, which airs Tuesday nights at 6pm Eastern on our Twitch channel. You can find all the previous episodes right up over here. And we have plenty more guides to the various classes and subclasses in D&D 5e right up over here. Please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time in, in the, the Dungeon. dungeon.